Hey guys, what's up? I'm Noah, this is Analog Resurgence, and today I'm taking a look at amateur 16 millimeter cameras. In the 1920s, Kodak introduced the 16 millimeter motion picture film format. Now there are so many different options out there for cameras and different ways to shoot on the format and for somebody who just wants to get into 16mm for the first time, it can be a little overwhelming. So today I want to take a look at some of the basic functions and features that you will find when you're buying a camera to shoot 16mm on the amateur side of things and just a few of the options that are out there for you guys to do it. Now when I talk about amateur cameras, what exactly do I mean? Now for 16 millimeter, these are cameras that you can get on a budget. These cameras also usually have spring wound motors as opposed to electronic motors that are run via battery or some other power source. And they're usually cameras that will only hold a hundred foot roll of 16 millimeter film. Also really important to know is that most of the time 16 millimeter amateur cameras are non-sync cameras. This means that they do not have precise enough motors to achieve and maintain a specific speed for you to be able to record and sync sound with in post-production. Now there are some options for shooting sync sound speed on some of these cameras that I will touch on briefly. Also by default a lot of these cameras were only ever made to shoot regular 16 millimeter sized frames. Regular 16 is more of a 4-3 square aspect ratio and later on Super 16 was invented which would allow you to shoot a more widescreen aspect ratio. Now a variety of cameras can be purchased or converted later on to shoot Super 16 millimeter, such as Bolexes and Krasnogorsks. Now these conversions do increase the cost of the camera, so you have to kind of figure out what specific features you want when you're shooting. And as a very last note, there is another aspect ratio frame size called Ultra 16 millimeter out there. Now Ultra 16 millimeter is kind of between regular 16 and Super 16. Now I don't know of many cameras that you can get for Ultra 16, but I believe there are some people online selling Bolex converted Ultra 16 millimeter cameras. So let's start with the Bolex and we'll use mine here as an example. The Bolex is super popular for amateurs who want to get into using 16 millimeter film and for years was very popular as a camera that was used by film school students. These are Swiss made cameras and there are a ton of variety of different models ranging from the 1930s into the 1960s. And the majority of these cameras are spring driven cameras. So you wind this handle here on the side and that allows you to shoot for about 20 to 30 seconds by winding up the spring driven motor inside of the camera. Now this does mean that you're limited in terms of how long your shots can last but there are some accessories for different motors that can go on the side of these Bolex cameras in order to let you do longer shots. Now by default, the Bolex can hold a 100 foot spool of 16 millimeter film inside of it. Now 100 feet of 16 millimeter film comes on what's called a daylight spool inside one of these boxes. The film is wound onto these metal spools and is light tight so you'll only lose the first few feet of film. It also means that you can load 100 foot cameras outside of a dark room so you don't need a dark room to load a Bolex. You can do it in the shade or in a little bit of dim light so you don't lose too much of the film but it is safe to handle outside of complete darkness. Now at 24 frames per second, a 100 foot roll of 16 millimeter film will get you about two and a half minutes worth of footage. Now the Bolex has a three lens turret on the front and this means that I can hold three individual lenses at once and I can change which lens I want to shoot with whenever I feel like. These are C-mount lenses, and C-mount lenses were very popular for older 16 millimeter cameras to use. Now this specific Bolex is also an earlier model, which means that I don't have a reflex viewfinder on the camera. So I'm not actually able to see directly through the lens that I'm shooting with. Any lens that is in this spot on the turret is in front of the film, but I'm not able to see through that using this viewfinder. I can use this viewfinder in order to look through a different lens up here and set my focus before rotating it down into position to shoot with. Then I have a different viewfinder on the side here to approximate framing when I'm actually shooting. Later Bolex models though did include a reflex viewfinder and they did this by using mirrors and different prisms inside of the camera so you could actually see what the lens in front of the film was seeing. Even later Bolex models also included the ability to hold a 400 foot magazine on top of the camera so you could load 400 foot rolls of film. Now again Bolex is a really popular, really beautiful and nice 16 millimeter amateur cameras. 
Now you can pick up non-reflex cameras like this one for usually under $400 or even cheaper than that. Now later models out there with different features and reflex viewfinders and 400 foot magazines and that have been converted to professionally shoot super 16 sized images will run you closer to $1,000 and above. So that is the Bull X. That's definitely one of the most recognizable 16 millimeter cameras out there for amateurs to use. You'll see them in movies and ad campaigns and just all over the place. But let's talk about some of the other models out there that exist for you guys to shoot as well. There is the Canon Scopic, and the Canon Scopic is kind of like a big Super 8 camera, but for 16 millimeters. So it's really good for beginners. It has a big built-in zoom lens on the front of it, and again, shoots 100 feet of film inside of it. So they're easy to load, it's easy to get film for, and these cameras are much cheaper than Bolexes. They also have electronic components inside of them and are battery operated which means that you can do shots on the Scopic that are longer than 20 to 30 seconds, whereas the Bull X, you are limited in that regard. Now there are cameras that came out of the USSR over the years, and these are all Soviet-made cameras. The most popular of which is called the Krasnogorsk 3, and I have no idea if I'm saying that because I've spent my entire life only reading it. Kras... Krasnogorsk. Krasnogorsk. This is a camera from the USSR and again takes 100 feet of film and you can usually find these for pretty cheap along with the Scopic. Some of these have also been converted to take M42 screw mount lenses, which are really popular lenses that you find for a lot of 35 millimeter photography SLR cameras, which means that you can find a ton of cheap, really interesting camera lenses out there that you can use on your 16 millimeter motion picture camera. There are some other cameras from the USSR as well, such as the Key F16. This one has a three lens turret as well and takes 100 feet of film, very similar again to the Bolex. But of course your lenses are more limited for this Key F as opposed to using the Bolex or the Krasnogorsk with an M42 screw mount lens on it. So many, many film cameras had this three turret lens set up on the front of them, which was really, really useful because it meant that you could have always a variety of lenses mounted to the camera and you could just change your lenses up, especially when you were out in the field shooting. Now other cameras with this three lens turret setup also included the Pathé French cameras and the much more popular Beulu R16 cameras. And again, Pathé and Beulu are two cameras that I'm sure I'm mispronouncing. Now the Beulu is much closer to the Bolex as well and had some models that would only take 100 feet and had later models that could take 400 feet, had electronic motors and also had spring wound motors. So those again offer a wide variety variety of different models from over the years that you can check out if you're looking to get one of those. Now if we go back even further, there are some 16 millimeter cameras from the beginning of the format that were released by Kodak themselves and also the company Bell & Howell. Some of them have very simple designs and can only hold one lens on the front of them. Now later models did have three lens turrets on the front, such as the Bolexes and the Pathés and the Beulis. Bell & Howell made a number of cameras over the years. Their really popular ones are called the Filmos and the Imos. These are really sturdy spring wound motors that you could use for shooting. The Filmo camera was used for 16 millimeter film, whereas the IMO camera is actually an amateur 35 millimeter motion picture camera. Both the IMO and the Filmo were very small, but very, very well built, which meant that they were used heavily in World War II by people overseas. So those are really a basic understanding of what's out there for the amateur crowd when shooting 16 millimeter film. Now again, these are all non-sync cameras, so you can't sync up sound with them later on after you've shot the film and recorded sound and try and edit them together in post-production. Even the battery powered ones. They still have very basic motors which means that they're just shooting an approximation of 24 frames per second as opposed to a crystal sync speed of 24 frames. In order to shoot sync sound on your 16 millimeter projects you're gonna need a higher end camera like an Arri or an Aton which are cameras that I'll talk about more in the future. Or for some of these amateur cameras you need what are called crystal sync motors. Crystal sync motors are motors that will specifically regulate the speed of an amateur camera and lock it in at a consistent frame rate in order for you to sync up sound with later. Now these motors don't exist for every type of camera that I mentioned, but you can get them for some later Bolex models. Some of these Bolex models also have other motors as well that aren't crystal sync motors, but still allow you to power the motor for longer than the 20 to 30 seconds that a spring wind motor would. Some cameras such as the camera and Scopic can be professionally converted in order to achieve these perfectly sync sound speeds for their motors. But those services are very expensive and very, very few people in the world 
do them. You should also avoid really old 16 millimeter cameras that take 16 millimeter film in cartridges. See, these cartridges are no longer made with film in them, which means that you're stuck having to reload new film into these old cartridges, and it can be very difficult. Now, there are some people who love these cameras, and it can be really interesting to use them and reload these cartridges and shoot with them. But if you're just trying to shoot 16 millimeter film, then the easiest way is to stick with these 100 foot daylight spools that a ton of cameras are capable of taking. They're the easiest to load and experiment with when you're getting into film for the very first time. So these 16 millimeter cameras that are aimed at more of the amateur crowd of shooting that format are usually beautiful and they're really well made and constructed and they really are great for using on a small scale just by yourself without a large crew and you don't need to know a ton about getting into film to be able to use one. There's so many resources online for Scopix and Krasnogorsks and Bolexes and I'll throw some different links down in the description for you guys to check out. But one of the most important things to keep in mind is that these cameras can age poorly. If they're stored bad or if they just haven't been used for decades and decades, then they won't have well-maintained mechanics inside of them, which just means that you can't use them. Now, luckily, there are people around the world who are capable of servicing these old cameras properly taking them apart, repairing them, cleaning them, lubricating all the mechanics inside of them, and then putting them back together. Now, depending on the type of camera that you have, and if you're looking to get it cleaned, lubricated, and adjusted properly, then you're gonna have to do a little bit of your own research, depending on what part of the world you're in and what kind of price range you're looking for. So, of course, in the future, I'm gonna look more at my specific Bolex and just go into a little bit more of the basic Bolex features and functions. And in the future, I'm gonna look at some of those much more expensive higher end cameras like the Aries and the Atons and ones that they use to shoot professionally for larger budget projects. Thank you guys so much for watching and checking this out and I love talking about 16 millimeter and motion picture formats and subscribe if you haven't done so already as I'll continue to post all sorts of this analog stuff for both motion picture and still film and instant film as well and just all this stuff in the future. If you are interested in supporting the channel there is a link to the Patreon for Analog Resurgence down in the description. You can hop over there and see what that's all about and get your name into some of these videos and help me support this stuff and do more stuff in the future. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon.